This is a HeadGum Podcast. Today's episode of the Black Girl Nerds Podcast is brought to you by Maddie's Rocket. Enjoy the comic book adventures of space pilot Maddie Waddy as she takes on monsters, aliens, and gangsters in this retro futuristic comic series, Maddie's Rocket. For the best in action drama, sci-fi, and Afrofuturism, pick up Maddie's Rocket by Tim Fielder. Go to dieselfunk.com. My Fluffy Puffs. My Fluffy Puffs has blended a variety of plant and vegetable oils that sink into your hair shaft, soothe the dry patches on your scalp, and form a barrier against heat, giving you curls that stay stronger, softer, and easier to style. Go to myfluffypuffs.com and save 10% on your next order using the code HYDRATE10. Want peace in the middle of this political chaos? Join the Truth Confidant with Vanetta R. Freeney Facebook group. You need a safe space to not only share your frustrations, but learn how to use them as fuel to accomplish your goals. We can't let the political debacle of 2016 stop us from success. And you can't have success without a clear and focused mind. That's where Mental Detox comes in. Join the Truth Confidant with Vanetta R. Freeney Facebook group to learn more. Launching on February 1st, just in time for Black History Month, is a brand new podcast series called Misty Nights Uninformed Afro, hosted by Jamie Brodnax and Stephanie Williams. Take a sneak peek at our podcast preview, launching on February 1st. Welcome to our new podcast, Misty Nights Uninformed Afro. The new podcast series will dive into the origin stories, character development, and story arcs of our favorite black superheroines and characters in comics. These are the obscure stories you don't always hear about, and we share commentary on some of our favorite moments in comics. We're going into deep discussions about Storm, Misty Knight, Monica Rambeau, Vixen, Amanda Waller, Riri Williams, Lunella Lafayette, and the Dora Milaje. The series has two hosts, founder and managing editor of BlackGirlNerds.com and host of the BGM podcast, yours truly, Jamie Brodnax, and Stephanie Williams, host of The Lemonade Show. Each episode will reference comic book issues, dates, and creators. That way you can go back and check out the stories for yourself. By the end of the series, you will become a certified expert in the fictional world of black superheroines. Please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. See you soon. creator of the Adventures of Moxie McGriff comics, and you're listening to Black Girl Nerd Podcast. Hi, I'm Vincent Jerome, and you're listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Hey there, this is Ava DuVernay, creator of Queen Sugar on OWN, and you're listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Yo, what's up? This is Shea Hodari Coker, the showrunner and creator and executive producer of Marvel's Luke Cage. You're listening to the Black Girl Nerds podcast. I am Micheline Hess. I'm the artist and writer of Malice in Ovenland and the Island Cats of Congaree, as well as the Anansi Kids Club and the All Saints Day Adventure. And you're listening to the Black Girl Nerds podcast. This is Shanae Gibbs. This is Chanel Gibbs, also known as the Gibbs Sisters. And we're on the Black, Black Girl, Girl Nerds, Nerds podcast. Hi, this is Rachel True, and you are listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. I'm Marcus Scribner from Blackish, and you're listening to Black Girl Nerds. Okay, game. 
for black girl nerds. Better shake your booties for black girl nerds. Yeah. Better shake your booties for black girl nerds. <laughs> Better shake your booties for black girl nerds. Better shake your booties for black girl nerds. Thanks for tuning into episode 99 of the Black Girl Nerds podcast. My name is Jamie and I am your host. This episode is titled Rosewood, Compersion, and a Rising Star. Three segments. In our first segment, we invite the hotness that is Morris Chestnut. He's here to talk to us about his show Rosewood, as well as his role in the film When the Bow Breaks which if you take a couple of listens back, we did a BGM podcast extra featuring his co-stars Regina Hall and Theo Rossi. In our second segment, we invite filmmaker Jackie Stone to talk about our new controversial project called Compersion, about open marriage and open relationships. That's going to be a good one. And in our third segment, we invite Sanaya Sidney. Sanaya Sidney played the lovely, lovely daughter of Viola Davis and Denzel Washington in the film Fences. She's also appeared in Roots and American Horror Story. So that's our show. Three incredible segments with three wonderful, wonderful guests. Segment one is hosted by Karan. Segment two is hosted by Tora. And segment three is hosted by Jessica. Thanks so much for tuning into episode 99 of the Black Girl Nerds podcast. Rosewood, Compersion, and a Rising Star. Enjoy! Morris Chestnut came into our radar in the groundbreaking 1991 film Boys in the Hood, playing the role of Ricky. He's appeared in numerous feature films and on TV series, including the starring role of pathologist Dr. Beaumont Rosewood Jr. in the Fox TV series Rosewood. He's also appeared in such films as Last Boy Scout, The Inkwell, Higher Learning, The Best Man, Two Can Play That Game, and When the Bow Breaks. Take a listen to this one-on-one interview with Morris and Karan. Hey guys, this is Karan with the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. And it's hard to believe it's been over 25 years since Ricky walked into our lives, introducing Morris Chestnut to the world in the groundbreaking film Boys in the Hood. Since then, he has planted his feet firmly on screens big and small. He's the star of When the Bow Breaks, now available on digital, DVD, and Blu-ray. And now he will light up our Friday nights on Rosewood when it returns on January 6th at its new time on Fox at 8. So check your local listings. We've come to know him as our brother, He's everybody's friend and one of Hollywood's finest, and we give thanks to the Almighty for the wondrous works of him. In the name of all that is gifted and chocolatey, welcome Morris Chestnut to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Wow, thank you so much. I need to have you do my intro all the time. Thank you. Thank you. I would love to. I would love to. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you as well. Can you believe it's been almost 26 years? I cannot. I cannot believe it's been that long. I mean, it's gone by at warp speed. I I just, I can't believe it. You know, I'd first like to know what's in your water because you don't age. (laughs) Well, I do drink a lot of water, especially when I'm training. So maybe that's, that has something to do with it. But thank you for the compliment. I saw you in the gym on Instagram working it out, wishing everybody a positive and happy new year. Now, do people still refer to you as Ricky? All the time. (laughs) All the time. It's getting less and less, though, I will say that. I mean, people, I am always going to be Ricky, mm-hmm. but they do see other characters now. Uh, a lot of times people do see Rosewood, and, you know, they do see uh, Lance. But I think Ricky is always going to be the the, uh, the signature role. How does it feel knowing you're not only loved by those of us who were coming of age with the film, but now even our children know who you are? You know, it's, <laughs> I have to say that that is, I just feel grateful. Sometimes I run into people and say, well, my mom, my mom was, is a huge fan of yours. I'm a huge fan of yours. Sometimes they say, my grandmother, my mama, and I'm a big fan of yours. <laughs> and, and just to know that I, I've affected people for three generations is just a blessing. And 
I'm just grateful that I have an opportunity to, to still be around and still to be to have such an effect on people at times. Well, When the Bow Breaks is a psychological thriller, and you star as John Taylor, the husband in a family that's struggling with fertility. What can you tell us about him and what drives him? John is a, is a hardworking family man. I mean, he's, he's desired to, uh, he's got a long desire to have a family. He and his wife had, had been trying for years to, uh, to conceive a child and it just hasn't worked. So now that they finally have this one last final opportunity, they're willing to sacrifice whatever they need to sacrifice to, to make it happen. Now, this family struggles to start a family of their own, but you have a beautiful one. Are you and your wife empty nesters yet? Thank you. Yes, we are. This year was the uh, first year that um, my daughter, my son went to college last year. My daughter went to college this year. You know they come back, right? Uh, they do. <laughs> they do. But the door's going to... The, the door is going to be locked, though. Once they graduate, the door is locked. Yes, yes. I concur. I concur. Now, I have to ask you, is Rosewood as much fun as it looks? Yeah, it really is. We really do have a great time on the show. And not even just with the regular cast, myself, Jaina, Dom, Eddie, Sam, uh, Gabrielle, uh, everyone. We have a great time. But even with our guest stars, it's you know people come. We have a family environment. People just, you know, they really enjoy being on our set. Now, everything is so bright and colorful in contrast to Rosie's role, investigating death. So what roles does the aesthetic and the backdrop of Miami play in the show? Well, we, we love the, the one thing about Miami, we love the, the, the sexual energy that you have. I, yes. I don't know if you've ever been to Miami mm. before, but as soon as you get <laughs> off the plane, there's just a sexual energy out there. So we love that dynamic. Then we love the, uh, the bright, cheery, sunny energy that it has that, you know, which, um, which feeds into his optimism. Well, Morris, I want to thank you for joining us. I know you're short on time. Do you have any words for the Black Girl Nerds out there? Black Girl Nerds, I just want to say thank you for supporting me throughout the years, and I'm just going to work harder. Each episode, each movie, each whatever I do to try to improve to bring the best quality product I can. Many blessings to you, my friend. You have our support. Thanks, Morris, for spending some time with us. You can catch Morris in When the Bow Breaks, now available on digital, DVD, and Blu-ray, and Rosewood, which now airs every Friday night at 8 on Fox. Jackie Stone is an award-winning director, writer, and content creator of a new web series called Compersion, a family drama about a couple exploring polyamory. She's a graduate of New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, and Stone has a penchant for visual storytelling, delivering poetic and precise work. Her films have screened at numerous festivals, including the American Black Film Festival, Chicago International Film Festival, LA Film Festival, and the California African American Museum and HBO Network. All right, you guys, thank you so much for listening to Black Girl Nerds. I'm Tora Shea, and we have Jackie Stone, the writer, director of Compersion. Thank you so much for coming on to Black Girl Nerds to talk about this amazing piece of art that you're sharing with the world. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and be a part of the Black Girl Nerd movement. <laughs> so I watched an episode I told you I was I read the concept and I was like let me you know let me try a little bit and I immediately was sucked into the world and um that was it I immediately devoured all of it (laughs) I loved it you created you created something amazing um for People who may not know um, what compersion is, can you explain what what it is and what the series that you created is about? Yes. Okay. So um, compersion is the name of my digital series. And basically, it's the story of a married couple, Josh and Kina, who've been married for 15 years. And the wife decides that she wants to open up their marriage and explore polyamory. And polyamory is a particular love style where you're able to um, have romantic relationships with more than one person, love-based relationships. And the word compersion um, basically means when you find happiness and pleasure with 
someone you love finding happiness and pleasure with someone else. So some people say the easy definition would be the opposite of jealousy. Yeah, I looked it up and I was immediately taken back by that definition. I was like, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard in my life. (laughs) I want that. That's, I feel like that's got to be what genuine love feels like. If you can love someone so much that you are, you love that they're being loved, that's, I don't know, that's different levels of love, but I don't know if I'm mature. (laughs) I mean, it's something like, you know, uh, because I know I have a, I I was telling another uh, person, I did a podcast recently, and I was like, I have a very ravenous heart and um, a very emotional, possessive one. And so jealousy, um, that's an emotion I know very well. Mm -hmm. And I would, you know, I've had compersion for people that I used to date and now they're in love with other people, but the, the being in love with someone and be like, Oh yeah, you're going out with Joanne. I'm so happy. Have fun. That, I mean, I definitely think it takes, um, especially if you're coming from a monogamous paradigm, it's a totally, totally different shift in how you think in terms of relationships and the emotions that, um, quote unquote, you are supposed to feel. And I definitely think it is a, a wonderful thing when you can be happy for your loved one who has found some happiness with someone else. I think it You have to be very emotionally aware and intelligent. Right. (laughs) So what interested you in highlighting polyamory through the lens of a Black couple? Well, um, I'm a Black woman. (laughs) I'm a a filmmaker who, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to um, go into film, like my background is in writing, and I wanted to do film because I wanted to create Home Place for Women of the African Diaspora. And it's basically safe spaces in film where Black women could be fully realized beings. And I wanted to tell stories that we normally don't get to see. Mm. And so um, compersion is just another example of that. Like I really wanted to highlight a different way, a different kind of love story. And I love to see uh, Black people in front of the lens because there's, there's not enough of us in front of the lens. And so when I was um, brainstorming this idea, because it came to me about a decade ago when I met a man who was polyamorous who wanted to date me, and I'd never heard of polyamory. And I was like, well, what the hell is that? What do you mean, polyamorous? Um, and then he explained the concept to me. And I was like, that would be a really interesting love story. And because most of my stories feature um, Black people, it was just natural to have my couple be Black and you know show a different aspect of Black love. I, I love seeing that um, aspect of Black love because these conversations, um, especially consider, especially around polyamory, are often considered racy or taboo, um, especially... Um, I noticed in the series, um, it was the woman, Kina, who initiated it. And that was something that was very liberating for me to see. Um, And I wanted to know if you purposely did it that way. Absolutely. (laughs) 100%. Um, Because I wanted to, one, I think people have this idea that... um, women are inherently monogamous and women don't desire more than one intimate romantic relationship. And we often see men who want to have uh, a extra person, not an extra person, but another romantic relationship. We, that's a paradigm we always see. If it's a, a relationship with multiple partners, it's usually a man and two women or it's usually a woman who's bisexual and they're bringing another woman in as their girlfriend. And I'd seen that. And I was like, I don't want to participate in that um, 
I don't want to showcase that particular um, situation because we've seen it so much. Not that it's not valid, but we've seen it so much. But we rarely get to see a woman saying that, you know what, I don't think monogamy is working for me. And I'm interested in not bringing in another woman. I'm a heterosexual woman and I want more than one man. Right. So, you know, playing a little bit with gender and people's ideals of what women want and what women should want. Right. And that was, it, it was beautiful to see that played out on screen. Um, so I noticed that there were themes within it. Um, there was kind of this buildup of with Josh and Colt, these ideals of masculinity and ownership, um, them kind of (laughs) (laughs) speak, speak girl, (laughs) fighting over who she belonged to. And it was never really about, well, it was more, Josh fighting over who she belonged to and Colt being like, no, this is her decision. (laughs) And it was definitely about it being her decision. Um, And I love, I loved seeing that because I, from what I gather, polyamory is supposed to be about shared love and honesty and not about owning each other. Right. Right. Um, I mean, the thing, what I say to people, um, I'm like, you know, compersion of the show is about a monogamous couple's journey into polyamory. Right. So Josh is working in the framework of what he signed up with. You know, he, he married Kina because he wanted a monogamous relationship to commit himself to her for the rest of his life. So, you know, to throw him a curveball in the 15th year of marriage and say that, you know what, this is not working for me. I want something else. For me, a lot of his, for the type of man that he is, a very traditional man, it's very logical for him to be possessive and to try to set these boundaries and my wife and my children and our family. It makes perfect sense. Where Colt, um, you know, he's coming in, he's he's a single man, Um He's had some tragedy in his life. Um, and so when he sees something that he wants and he does, I don't think he connects with a lot of people that often um, he's willing to make a move for it. Right. You know, and I think at this point in time, he understands that. Um, that he, he, there's these boundaries, at least for the first season, that he's trying to maneuver in and out of, if that makes sense. No, it does make sense. I, <laughs> I love the symbolism of him trying to create a space within his home that was, this is where you leave <laughs> this is where you leave all of that other stuff. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Take that stuff off. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I love how you, you try not to uh you try not to uh yeah, I'm tell trying people such a way. <laughs> You're talking about episode eleven. Um you know what I love about that? Um because you watched them all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's a there's a shift, right? Because in episode five is when he comes to the house and the power dynamic is largely in Josh's hands. Cause he's, you know, he's puffing out his chest. It's my house, you know, and he tells him, he, you know, he tells him to sit down in a way that you, you really shouldn't tell another grown man to sit down. Right. But Cole, you know, definitely when he comes back to his house to hit Oh, to oh, I, I, I hate like if I'm giving something away. Y'all should have watched it already. I'm not gonna give too much away. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's definitely leave that outside. There's a certain certain way I want things to happen in this home, and it's also his power play, right? Because this is my house. 
if you want to come in here, this is what it's going to be, you know? And those two have amazing chemistry. Um, Josh and Karamu, who played Derek and Colt, like... They do. <laughs> watching them, I just, I'm just smiling off camera and writing for them is just amazing just to see it come to life. And Colt and Kena have great chemistry and I love Josh and Kena's relationship. I mean, I was really blessed by the actors who agreed to come on to our little uh, low budget um, uh, digital series. They're amazing. I love them. So can you talk to me a little bit about open an open or polyamorous relationship versus cheating and dishonesty? Uh, yes. So, which we, we, we showcase a little bit in conversion. Yes, we do. (laughs) (laughs) We'll get there. (laughs) So, you know, the ideal with polyamory, it's, um, ethical non-monogamy. So people who are polyamorous, um, believe they love differently than someone's monogamous, that the heart has capacity to love multiple people at the same time, but you must be also open about your relationships. So, um, if I was married and, you know, my husband was like, you know, I want to have a girlfriend, he would have to express that to me and we would talk about it. And I'd be like, well, you know, um, there's a gentleman that I would love to see, or there's two gentlemen I would love to see, but everybody knows what's going on ideally that is what um polyamory and ethical non-monogamy is now cheating we all understand how cheating works it's in secret no one's supposed to know it's uh going behind your partner's back um and that's something you know many people who are polyamorous um frown upon And not to say that there are people who are polyamorous who have not been dishonest, but the ideal of polyamory is that it's open, it's ethical, we all know about it, and we move from there. Yeah. Are there gray areas? Is it possible to be in a polyamorous relationship and still end up (laughs) doing something that would be considered cheating? Yes. Yes, because I mean, it's still, I mean, if you're not honest about it, you know, it's absolutely, you know, you could be, you could be cheating in a, in a polyamorous relationship. Mm-hmm. Okay. Absolutely. So. When you're not open about it, you know, yeah, absolutely. So I feel like um, one of the biggest issues I saw with um, Josh was his feeling like he wasn't the reason that um, Kina wanted to go outside or to the reason that she was interested in polyamory was that he felt that he wasn't enough for her anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do you combat those feelings? Um, And I, I don't know how to express this. (laughs) I mean, I don't, you know, I wouldn't have, (laughs) Um, I noticed that you, I noticed that she made him feel, you know, loved, but he still ended up Mm -hmm. jealous of her connection with Colt. Absolutely. I mean, I I think it's human. Listen, (laughs) if, if you, I mean, at least for me, I know I'm in a relationship with somebody for 15 years and I'm like, this is going great. We're happy. We have a family. And my mate says, Hey, Jack. I want to date other people. What? But why am I not enough? Because automatically we go to our own deficits or what we perceive our deficits to be. Because how could you want to be with someone else when you love me? And I think, at least for fictional Josh, that's going to take some time for him to work through. It's not an overnight process. Right. Like, That's what I gathered as well. I was, <laughs> I was wondering if there's ever, if there is going to be a time where he gets past feeling like it's his fault, and I kind of felt like Colt also aided in that in some of the conversations that they had, um, in that 
feeling like, well, you drove her to me in whatever it was that you were doing. In oh, your- yeah, just, <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, you know, it's, I think a lot of, a lot of it is ego. Right. And hurt. And you know what I tell people? And when I, when I decided to shoot Compersion, I was coming up with the idea and the concept and the characters for it. I wanted to see how a monogamous couple gets to be a polyamorous one and how they move from one end of the spectrum to the other end to compersion. And so I'm, I'm interested in the, the work and the struggle and the fighting before you get to the mountaintop and you see that lovely valley um, underneath you. So I didn't want it to be fairy tale. I wanted it to be very human and, and, and um, um, you know, just really get into the marrow of the bone of a relationship between a particular couple. So, you know, people who watch could be hopeful because it's called compersion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's going to be a job to get to compersion. I'm here for it. I'm interested. <laughs> I want to see how they get there. <laughs> it's not, it probably won't be in season two. <laughs> but, you know, um, and when they do, when, you know, I mean, and, you know, I love my Josh, you know, people's like, oh my God, poor Josh, or they hate Josh. Uh, you know, a lot of people who are like, um, who watch the series are polyamorous. So they, they are so hard on Josh and, you know, He's, I mean, I, I love all my characters. So it's like, I'm like a mama. I can't say I favor one over the other, but I'm like, Josh's journey is going to be one of the best journeys ever in the series because he has fallen so dramatically. Um, and it's just going to be such a fun pleasure to rebuild him. Mm-hmm. But yeah. there's definitely, you know, there's going to be moments of compersion and then it might go away because, you know, it's life. There's ups and downs, but there's no fairy tales. So, you know, right. I, I like so struggle more. about this toast. So I'm not going to get too much <laughs> into Josh's um, because I don't want to give too much away his uh-huh. um, selfishness. Because that's, I mean, I, I, I love Josh's character, but at the root of it, kind of what he did, it, literally in that moment, kind of saying, "No, you can't have this," and then. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> but Kina's toast, just the duality of that language. Just Yes. Yes. You how how did you write that toast for Josh and for the people in the room? Because it seemed <laughs> it was such a beautiful toast it seemed like you wrote it for Josh and for his parents listening and for the children. It seemed kind of like how they had to make their relationship. It it kind of seemed symbolic in how they had to craft their relationship for their parents to still approve of and for their kids to still not be able to see through. I would say the toast, it, it's twofold. So there's what you say and then there's what you really say, right? The subtext. Right. And I think Kina would have had similar words to say to Josh if the things hadn't transpired as they had, but the meaning underneath them would have been different. Right. Because Kina believes her husband to be all of those great things that she stated. Um in her toast, but because of what, what knowledge she had prior, the meaning changed. Right. Because everything that she, the best of him, he did not show. Exactly. And I think Kina is a person who, um, I think she gets her, she would, she would not want to disrupt and create chaos for her children or for her in-laws. Right. Right. So she's able to maintain her composure and get her point of cross to her husband. I do not know how she did that. I have never had that much. (laughs) (laughs) 
that much composure in my life. Like, <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> Maybe you have to have some kids <laughs> to have those levels. Because... And then you know, but underneath it, like she's shanking, she's shanking him at that dining room table. She's shanking him throughout that whole toast. Right. You know, it's like a nice, quiet shank to the liver. Um, and I think it would have been easier for Josh if she would have went off. Right. Cause those words did cut deep. I mean, uh, my mother used to have those abilities to just say <laughs> things and I would just say, you could have just spanked me. I just, <laughs> but, but what she said really his face mm-mm. <laughs> he just those tears that he was holding his face turned just mm, just <laughs> red <laughs> I mean Derek is the king Derek who plays Josh is the king of acting in silence his right. questions are <laughs> I would just watch him and either he would have me in tears from like sadness or like literally in tears, like dying, laughing. And when we're done with this podcast, we could talk more about the particulars so we don't spoil it for the people who haven't seen it. But he, right. um, yes, I mean, that's like I think that episode is one of my one of my favorites um, in the series, the the season finale. Right. It's so. And then when she leaves. And I'm just like, girl, I know you're mad, but wait, wait, girl, wait. (laughs) Where are you going? (laughs) That's what Josh wanted to know. Where are you going? Out. But I, okay, so I was mad too, and I yelled the same thing at the time. (laughs) We're going out. (laughs) We're going out. I love it. We're going out. Josh. <laughs> but I loved how real and raw that scene was because it's so often I I've, I've had those I've had those arguments where I just want to get away and clear my head and it's are you leaving me and it's no we're just mad this is just a fight like <laughs> calm down are you <laughs> Just let me go clear my head and decide. <laughs> right, right. He's like, wait a minute now. No, I need to know now. Where are you going? Where are you are going? You leaving Where are you me? Do you see a suitcase? Like what? <laughs> <laughs> Where am I go? My kids are here. Like, <laughs> right, right. Hold on one second. My dog's acting full. Go, go lay down. The mailman must be coming. She goes crazy. Go lay down, Cookie. You're ruining the interview. Oh. <laughs> He's so precious, but she does not like the mailman. They had it out one day. She's a little tiny dog too. Um, cookie, hold on one second. Cookie. You better behave. You don't want me to get called puppy abuse. Um, <laughs> I would never abuse her. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> That's hilarious. But yeah, I loved that scene so much because her anger, even in that moment, you could tell that she still loved him so much that she wasn't letting out all of this like rage that she had. Right. Still wanted to go calm down and think a bit and go get whatever it was out. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I was just, girl. But you know, I mean, eventually it's going to have to come out, but, um, yeah, but that's that's still love, you know, because I <laughs> <laughs> tell us about it. Tell us about it. I want to know <laughs> <laughs> because I I don't know. I I don't know if that I could have been in that situation and held that much grace. <laughs> and you know what I like, uh, you know, and just think. Um, the, the thing is, like, thinking really about Kina and Kina's character. And how pissed off and hurt she was, but knowing that she has the children in the family, not wanting to say anything that she would regret and being upset. But I'm like, and my, my challenge was her being hella upset, but doing it in a way 
that is not explosive and breaking stuff. Right. Because I think once I made her contain it, the dialogue became that more interesting to me to write. Right. Because those are some perceptive children and they would have picked up. <laughs> they're so cute, but they are so <laughs> And your kids are. Children are very perceptive. Like we think they're not, but you know, and that little Delilah, she's always ear hustling and you know, <laughs> up in the business, you know, so, you know, being conscious of, I think Kina and Josh are very good parents. They allow their children to have some freedom um, to question, you know, but I, I think they're, they don't want to drag their children into this particular thing, you know, what they're, what they're going through and what, the, how their relationship may be shifting. And so Kina is like, okay, let me keep it together. I want to go off, but you know, sometimes once you go off, you continue to go off. Right. <sighs> right. <laughs> you know, that's why at that table she's toasting, she's going off, but it's in a very, you know, ticking time bomb sort of way. You know, and I think when you know your, your mate, you know what they're saying to you. Well, he knew he had on that. Um, I don't know if you do memes, but, um, I don't know if you've seen the Jordan crying face. Yes. Oh my God. That Jordan crying face. is amazing. Like how uh, the life is that. <laughs> That's literally what he was doing over there. In the corner. <laughs> he was just sitting there like. Um, she doesn't <laughs> say it, is she? <laughs> I, love that. I, I think somebody should put the crying mean face on Josh. I'll that would be hilarious. Don't challenge me. I'll do. Please, please. Oh my god, because I'm not good at that. I, you know, I have ideas for different memes that from things that the characters have done. I'm like, oh, that would be a fun meme. But I, I don't even know how that works. I'm like, I can't even open my brain to that. Please put that Michael Jordan face on him. Please. <laughs> oh my God. I'll post it everywhere. I'll do it. I'll do it. That is hilarious. <laughs> I'm, I'm in tears. I'm in tears. I'm in tears. Oh God. Oh, okay. thank you so much for sharing this with us and talking to me about this. I love this series. Um, so can you tell us where to, um, can you tell listeners where to go to support and where to find the series and where they can go if they want to check out C or to help out with season two, because. Absolutely. <laughs> we will start with, uh, checking out how to help with season two first, and then we'll go to the other things. Um, so we are running an Indiegogo pa- campaign. And it, we have maybe 24, I think, 24 days left in the campaign. Um, if you go to Indiegogo and just type in Compersion, we will come right up. Uh, we're trying to raise $65,000. Right now we have 10. Um, any contribution, no matter what the size, $5, $1, 25 50 100 more, whatever you want to give or can give, greatly appreciate it. We have some amazing perks. Um, we want that 65000 so we could do another juicy season. And you could find the show um, on our YouTube um, channel. And our address is youtube.com backslash the Enchant TV X. Or you could just type in Enchant TV and we will pop up. You could follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the Enchant TV. And you could also go to our lovely Facebook page at um, Enchant TV on Facebook. And lastly, if anyone wants to follow me, you could follow me on Twitter at MSJJ Stone. Well, thank you so much once again for coming on Black Girl Nerds. This has been amazing. <laughs> it's been awesome. It's so quick. It's already over. I can't believe it. <laughs> I feel like it feels like it's been quick because you're so hilarious. <laughs> I'm like, that was in and out, in and out. <laughs> uh, I did one where it was, I think, a little bit over an hour and some change because we were just running our mouths, um, you know. So this is just like boom, boom, boom. 
I'm sorry. No, no, it's <laughs> great. I, I, I felt like I was holding up <laughs> your time. No, uh, please. No, you aren't. You see, um, you know, it was <laughs> great. I was like, this is, we've been here, what, three minutes? In and out. <laughs> <laughs> are you based? Where are you based? I'm in North Carolina. Oh, North Kakalaki. Mm-hmm. We're all over, though. We, I call nerds, does stuff all over. <laughs> okay. I love the website. I love it. It's stalking. <laughs> I so it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time and watching the series and subscribing. I'm just so honored to be able to talk to you about it, to be honest, because when I first started watching it, I was just like, whoever this person is that makes this is absolutely a genius because she the way the way that you ugh, the way that you just wrote the characters the way that you made the story so relatable even for people who aren't polyamorous i mean i'm not polyamorous but it's something that i've talked about i'm actually (laughs) i'm actually the one that's um i'm in a relationship but um we've talked about it (laughs) and you know what to be honest with you it's like there's the the series for me it was a it's a family drama and, you know, one of the things that we're exploring is polyamory. And, but, you know, at the core, it's a family drama you know, mm-hmm. about this particular family. And I want to open it up to different people. But at the core, it's about these two, how they maintain their family relationship. How do they explore other relationships? How, how they parent their relationships with their in-laws, their relationships with their siblings, you know. So it, this is one of the themes and I hope to grow it out if I get some money. <laughs> I love that you made it still a family drama. I love that you kept the girls in it. I love the relationship that you made with the family. It's just, it's great all around. Like, I really like it. Um, <laughs> whenever I watch things, whenever I watch series like these, I kind of get really, really angry <laughs> at the world. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> that series like this don't get funding but like kevin james gets another series who's like, kevin james um paul blart that that guy the mediocre funny white guy who's from oh, okay. um, king of king king of King of yeah, Queens. King of Queens, that guy. King of Queens. They just keep giving him stuff, and he's just, uh, I, you know what I mean? They just, stuff like that keeps getting funding, whereas, you know, this <laughs> is good and amazing, and it's, <sighs> I don't know. I, I, you know what I would say? <laughs> it's like, for people who like it, like, we have a, if the audience who subscribe to the channel, or the audience who just watched the season finale would support it and give 10 to $25, we'd be overfunded. Um, and, you know, I'm like, with the whole internet, where we have this, the way to distribute content that can go across the globe, we could put anything out there, but it's just, you know, getting the support of the people who want to see it, you know? So I would love to have compersion on HBO or Showtime or right. FX, that would be awesome. But you know, if that doesn't happen, if I find ways to support the series and keep it digital and have an audience who is actively participating and actively contributing so that they can see the thing that they like, that's great too. Because I want to, you know, the ideal behind Enchant TV is I want to grow the network. I have a few other shows that I want to put out in 2017. Um, okay, well, I'm excited for that too. <laughs> I'll let you know. I'll come back on. <laughs> new show, you know. Um, so you know, if 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 an audience shows up, I will show up for the audience. All right. Well, we'll boost. Get some funding in there. <laughs> oh, thank you. Appreciate your payday. Shout outs to paydays everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> love a payday. Love a payday. <laughs> And thank you so much for having me on and being such an absolute pleasure. And we must keep in touch because you're a riot. (laughs) Thanks again. You have a wonderful day, okay? Sanaya Sydney is a rising star. 
She's known for her roles in American Horror Story Roanoke, Roots, and two big box office holiday favorites, Fences and Hidden Figures. Sydney began acting in 2012 in a short film called The Babysitters. After that, she starred in Roots, American Horror Story, Fences, and now Hidden Figures. Check out this amazing interview from a rising star featuring host Jessica. So you guys, this is Jessica here with the Black Girl Nerds Podcast, and I am so excited uh, because I have Sanaya, correct? I'm saying it correctly, right? Yes. Yes, wonderful. So Naya Sydney on the line, and she's going to tell us a little bit about some of the roles that she's uh, currently acting in. She is awesome, you guys. She is just really rocking it out right now. So <laughs> right you. now, you no, you are you're the one doing it. You are the front runner here. I I just want to be like <laughs> you when I grow up. Um, so you are currently you've landed a role as Flora in American Horror Story. So tell us a little bit about yes, that. Ma'am. Well, um, it was really fun to do because I got to see a lot that I, people don't see every day. Mm-hmm. But um, to see all the makeup and behind the scenes and how they really built and create stuff, it's really artistic. And I love how everything is big, but when you act it out, it feels so real. <laughs> oh. And so I also... My, I, this might sound a little harsh, but my favorite thing to put on almost every day is the fake blood. Because <laughs> it was like, just to put the makeup on a daily basis, it looked like, it's just so awesome and get to play with that stuff and put it on and make it look so real and scare a lot of people. But I mean, at the same time, I knew that I would, um, because while, while I was doing this, I of course, I had so much fun with uh, Sarah Poulsen mm-hmm. and Angela Bassett and Cuba. They mm-hmm. were nice. And uh, mm-hmm. I learned a lot from them. And we just acted off to each other. And it was mm-hmm. a fun project to do because uh, that was my first, you know, doing something horror-related. Re- uh, <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, it sounds like it was amazing, especially for you every day (laughs) to be able to dress up that way. Wow. Um, So you've been acting for quite a while, right? (laughs) When did you begin acting, even though you're still young? (laughs) When did you begin acting? At what age? I began acting when I was five years old. Wow. Wow. And what inspired you to start acting at such a young age? Well, I um I would watch, you know, Miley Cyrus on Hannah Montana and stuff and I just liked how she got to, you know, uh, not just her, you know, uh I would always I also like voiceovers, you know, Finis Phineas and Verb and mm-hmm. uh, you know, I love uh Lab Rap, all that and I just saw how you can tell they have so much fun on that doing it on TV, they do what they love, and so I knew that I wanted to be an actor from the day I saw all of them act, and I got to, you know, just see that, you know, let them be able to, you know, have panels and Q&As and, uh, you know, uh, red carpets and stuff, and I just didn't want to do that. I also wanted to be in front of the camera and let people to be able to recognize my face and, you know, doing what I love. Oh, wow. Well, you know, I, I'm sure they recognize your face now because you started off um, <laughs> as young Kizzy, right? And the new adaption of Alex yes, Haley's yeah. Roofs. You started off there. Yes. And then you went over to um, Hidden Figures, right? With uh, you were yes. Taja P. Pinson's daughter in the upcoming film yes, Hidden right, Figures, yes. correct? Wow, yes. you are, you are just amazing. You are just making rounds, right? <laughs> and Thank now you. uh, you're moving into your own with um, this new project. So tell us a little bit about Fences. And also, wait a minute, hold on. Denzel actually personally picked you and casted you for the film as well? Yes. Uh, so um, it all started when I, of course, I heard about the audition, and mm-hmm. I did a self-tape, and then I had to fly out to Pittsburgh 
the callback. So wow. Uh, he, he told me this. This is what really touched me. He said from that day, he knew when he saw my self tape, he knew he wanted a cat. But wow. he would, he just wanted to call, you know, call me back and say hello, basically. And, mm-hmm. you know, do it over again and see if I still, you know, got it. But he said from that day, he already knew who was going to play right now. And I, I felt just so touched and loved. And he's, of course, a very nice man. Uh, he's so lovable. And um, he taught me a lot also. So wow. especially working on that project was a very, mm-hmm. you know, very beautiful time. Yeah. Just being so working, in- working on a project with Denzel Washington and then having Denzel kind of teach you <laughs> and mentor you on set. That's yeah. amazing. So you work with both Denzel <laughs> and Viola Davis. And I, I see yeah. here, yeah. it says also that they loved working with you and that you have some great stories mm-hmm. to tell. So tell me one of the most memorable, memorable times or stories that you have from working with Denzel and Viola. Um, well, um, there was this one story where actually not just me and Viola and Denzel, it was actually the whole cast, and we were doing a scene at the very end, and we were in the backyard, and mm-hmm. there's this little gate, and if you watch the movie, you will see the gate closed. So this little gate, this eyes are closed by itself. Uh-huh. And it was so, I call it August Wilson's spirit because I felt <laughs> like he came to visit wow. us. <laughs> oh, and my goodness. so what happened was you were in the middle of scene, you know, you can't get out of character, but mm-hmm. what really, what Dindel put in the movie was actually good timing. I turned around and I looked at the gate and the gate, nothing, no strings, no, you know, special effects. It closed by itself. And that was just a touching moment. Everybody heard it and everything, but they still had to stay in character. But you know me, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I just turned around. I yeah. looked and then I looked forward. <laughs> and then when he called cut, he came out and said, you guys saw what happened. And we were like, oh, no, no, no. He called us in the house to see the monitors. And everybody saw it, and it was so so surprising. Like, it it touched us. And we were so close to that, because when we saw it, we were, we couldn't believe our eyeballs. (laughs) Because we we knew that August Wilson, you know, visited us. Like, he actually came to put something in the movie to say, hello. Wow, that is amazing. So um, so coming on from that, Fences is a period piece that takes place in the 1950s, right? And like you said, it's based off of August uh, Wilson's award-winning play. Um, So how was it to transform and kind of move from like our whole tech era of now and go back to 1950s (laughs) on set? Well, it was because... I've already, or you know, I already worked on the 19, the season stuff, and you know, 1800. Oh. Uh-huh. So I was kind of, you know, a little used to it, you know. Uh, but mm-hmm. that that's because I was I wasn't surprised that it was in the 1950 because American Horror Story was my first period piece, like and the two. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you know, and now era, but. But Roots and Hidden Figures were more later in, you know, 1950s mm-hmm. and 1800s and stuff. So uh, those clothes and just to recognize and see how it was like back then, it's, so, it's always wonderful to see what it looked like in the old times. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. That's great. So now moving on, you also have a second film that's going to be coming out around Christmas time, correct? called Hidden Figures. Yeah, so tell me a bit about your your part in Hidden Figures where you play um you play again Henson's daughter, correct? 
I play, I'm sorry, I play who? You play Henson's daughter, correct? T Taja P. Henson's yes, daughter? Yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. Sorry, yes. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, so tell me a little bit about your role there. Well, I play um, one of her daughters. I am the middle child. She has three girls, mm -hmm. Kathy, Constance, and Joyalette. Um, I am Constance. <laughs> That's actually my manager's name. <laughs> I oh, wow. play Constance, <laughs> and uh, she is basically, you know, of course, she's a middle child, and uh, mm -hmm. she connects with everybody and with her sisters most of all, you know. She's you know, the middle one where, you know, she's not the oldest, but she still has to take care of her sisters, even though if they're the youngest or oldest. And, you know, uh, we have a special bond with her mother, and mm -hmm. we're there to support her um, because our dad is not there. So, basically, we're all there for each other. And, you know, we, we come to support her for helping the astronauts go in space and stuff and try to you know, still over happy, happiness and joy, even know how, how much we miss her. We still know that she's there for us, and we're there for her. And th throughout the story, it just shows how everybody connects with each other and how um, it was like back then and how everybody loved, loved each other, even though no matter what happened. Yeah, that's amazing. So to tell our audience just a bit, um, Octavia Spencer and Kevin Costner are in the film Hidden Figures, and it takes place in the 1960s, and it tells the story, yeah. the true story, by the way, of three African-American yeah. mathematicians who computed the mm -hmm. trajectory for the first Apollo mission into space in the moon landing. That is amazing. To be yeah. a part of that movie and the yeah. remake of history, that is something <laughs> special. You know, so you should feel I very, know. very proud. You should feel very, very I proud. I am. I'm, yeah. I know. It's really touching and so ha I'm so happy to be a part of all these projects, especially Hidden Figures, because uh, it taught me, you know, a little bit, a little bit more of history, because I'm mm -hmm. not really the history buff type. So when <laughs> I right? researched on it, you know, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> My dad, this we buff. But when I when I really, you know, looked into it, I learned a little bit about, you know, the how it was back then and how how they dealt with it and how smart um Captain Johnson was. So mm -hmm. um to learn that those women were the the um first African American women the first work in NASA was outstanding and so so awesome to work on and to learn about. Yeah, that's amazing. So how did you feel being in that space and knowing that history after you after you hadn't known it? How did you feel um as a little girl and as an African American girl in that space? How did you feel? Well, I felt like this, I I should be here because this is going to teach a lot of people because mm -hmm. not a lot of people know about our history so um yeah. even though this is like you know also also uh how telling about their life and what happened it also shows on it turns around onto the african-american and black people's life and mm -hmm. um it shows how it was that then not a lot of black women especially weren't allowed to you know go to certain places or vote and stuff and exactly. so yeah. to know that these were the first three African American women to work in NASA, mm -hmm. that's going to show a lot of people, wow, I never knew that. Yeah, definitely. And Give a sense of empowerment, huh? I, I hope yes, I hope it touches a lot of people and uh mm -hmm. to be an African American little girl, mm -hmm. um, I learned more about my history. Me, everybody, we all did learn about our history and something that I never knew. And um, I feel proud to be an African-American woman. Well, oh, girl, I not <laughs> young women. <laughs> um, well, you are growing into. I just, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. growing into. <laughs> 
<laughs> Definitely. Well, I totally get what you're saying. So, Miss Sydney, you have been deemed as uh, the next rising star- young starlet, and I think that you are absolutely on your way. You. So, congratulations on Thank all you. of your success. And you know, it really takes a lot of uh, determination and pride and confidence to get out there and do what you're doing. So, continue to keep doing what you're doing, and I look forward to seeing you on the silver Thank screen for a long, long time to come. You too. Nice talking to you, Lou. Yeah, nice speaking with you as well. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye. The Black Girl Nerds Podcast is produced by Jamie Brodnax. Various episodes are edited by Jamie Brodnax, MR Daniel, and John Bauer. The opening theme song to our show is written and performed by Samus. Various instrumentals are performed by Samus, Sky Blue, and Shubzilla. You can find episodes of the Black Girl Nerds podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Spreaker, and Spotify. That was a HeadGum Podcast.